Hello, everyone. I'm Marilyn Turkovich, the Executive Director of the Charter for Compassion. And today is a very special conversation with Leslie Undwin. And it's in regards to a film that she made called India's Daughter. But first, I want to talk a little bit about the Charter for Compassion. Um, as many of you know, the Charter is there with two missions, really. One is to work with grassroots organizations in cities, communities, villages around the world to take a serious glimpse of who they are in their communities and to look at that overall picture of who they are and what is so troublesome inside those communities. And we're here to try and help them facilitate not only a conversation, but an action plan to begin to bring about change. And the change is in the hands of all of us. And the second arm of our mission is to look at education. And what does compassion in education really mean? And it means quite a bit, depending on the place where you live, it's filled with looking seriously at cultural values, at looking at the, the way in which we live, to look at different philosophies that we hold within a particular culture. And so we have a Charter Education Institute, we have an education forum that we deliver twice a month, and now we have a film series. And the film for this month is India's Daughter. And I met Leslie and I've been sitting here thinking, when did I meet Leslie Undwin? Um, maybe it was in another life because every time we meet, um, the conversation seems to go on for hours and hours and hours, whether it's in, um, excuse me for saying this, in a tequila bar in Mexico uh, or somewhere else in the world. Um, and, you know, part of our association with one another is the result of what happened after this horrendous situation that occurred in India to what has now been a program for children three to six years old around the world to help all of us begin to understand how we can educate youth, children in a different way. And so um, all of this will be part of the conversation uh, today. One of the things about the Charter for Compassion is that as an organization, we try very hard to be a flattened organization. And that within itself is, is a, a challenge. But we look at the way that we exist in, in society, in our own communities. And we're, we are broken into sectors, uh, but we hope that that's an artificial breakage, uh, that there are really no lines of demarcation, but we try hard to interconnect between those things we find in society, from art to business and education and health, uh, and certainly in gender and partnership relationships. So this particular program today is being brought to you uh, by women and girls who are part of the partnership part of, of the Charter for Compassion. Too many parts there, right? Um, so I'm going to, um, I don't know how much introduction we should say about Leslie. She is a holistic, energetic person who is a global citizen. She is a documentary filmmaker, or I think she's going to say she was a documentary filmmaker. And now she's so dedicated to the field of education. She's more than that. I mean, she is that global citizen. She is that energetic person that you want to, to have a great dinner with. Um, and she's that individual who really makes you reflect um, on your own thinking. So uh, I think there'll be other parts that you'll pick up on who Leslie is. And so welcome uh, to this webinar and I'm going to turn it over to Brenda. Thank you, Marilyn, very much. Welcome everyone and welcome Leslie. It's very nice to be here with you. 
I'm with the women and girls and um, wanted to talk about, first of all, um, through the women and girls of the charter, we've cultivated um, with great care a safe and sacred space for women, girls, and all genders to be together and in sanctuary first with themselves. We developed and expanded into what is now the gender partnership sector. From reaction to response several years ago, we helped each other collaborate to understand how to respond then to react. We then moved into expanding the voice of women and girls in our V2020 series by reigniting the original Mother's Day proclamation of Julia Ward Howe. We elevated and anchored the voices of women from many walks of life in the world to meet and recognize those who had gained notoriety and to introduce them to those doing great works in our local areas. This journey enabled us to grow into a space where partnerships develop at deeper levels because people feel safe and are realizing the sacredness of their own body and the importance of their actions. Through the V2020 series, we met and uh, Rianne Eisler and studied more of her work on partnerism. And we moved in our journey and this enabled us to grow into a space where partnerships um, developed into a firm footing for women and girls to gain the courage to open their hearts and minds into the strength of the divine feminine rather than the dysfunctional feminine that often reacts due to trauma, oppression, fear, and lack of recognition. So our next step was to speak and highlight solutions while staying present to listening compassionately to the tragedies occurring. So when our charter colleagues wanted to offer India's daughter your amazing documentary in the film series that we're having, our immediate answer was no. While we acknowledge tragedies such as this murderous rape, we have created such a safe and sacred space that women have felt safe to be with us and are growing into their own inner strength by clearing the trauma in their bodies as they remember, they are sacred. They're learning to trust and be in partnership with us and others. And we had no desire to open the sacred space and dishonor our promise to provide safety in little progress. So rather than stay though, with our initial response of a no, we also learn, have learned to inquire deeper and listen, and so we did. We opened our hearts and minds to listen and learn what you, Leslie, have done and learned why. <sighs> we learned that you listen from the depth of your knowing, and this is how you birthed Think Equal. While we do not shelter ourselves or others from the reality of the horrific activities taking place in the world, it is important to not inflict harm by re-traumatizing people who have experienced similar circumstances, nor do we wish to traumatize people, traumatize people who have not had this experience. The power of pictures and words can harm another. Our eyes alone have 144 receptors that feed into 144 chakras that can physically open pain doors and cellular memory causing the psyche to go into fight, flight, and freeze. This can overwhelm a person. And this is why the film requires that you consciously ask to view it and that you can participate in this conversation today without having watched the film. It is an active everyday practice to keep our eyes and hearts open to the realities of terror and to be clear with what we are able to receive and what we want to magnify and therefore manifest. We also wanted to acknowledge that this film depicts an occurrence and belief system alive in India today, yet it does not live only in India, as we know. Every country has customs, 
laws and traditions that have not yet evolved into compassionate behavior and loving kindness for all people and life itself. Therefore, this is not a judgment on one country. It's an example of what happens, unfortunately, in our world. As we broadened our view, we learned of Leslie's journey and how birthing Think Equal is creating ways for people in any country to raise children with a new view of the world and thereby cultivating opportunities for customs, laws, and traditions to change and transcend. So we compassionately changed our no to yes and are honored to have you spend time with Leslie and us today so that we may learn, grow, together in partnership, safely, and right now. So we are recording this so that as we go into Q&As, please keep that in mind that this will be broadcast because this voice, this work, and this expansion of our consciousness is important. There you go, and now Sara, take over, please. <laughs> Thank you, Brenda, for that um, very thoughtful and deep introduction of our intention for today. Um, I do want to light a candle because uh, for Jyoti, for her parents, and for the many victims around the world. We do not want the conversation just stay, to stay on what happened. We are focused on solution. However, I just watched the documentary and <clears throat> still touched by, by it, enraged by it. So I really feel the need of, let's hope my candle works here or my lighter. Um, I feel the need to acknowledge Jyoti, what she stood for and her parents, what they stand for. Sorry. Oh. Leslie, welcome. Um, in our initial conversation, when I first got to meet you, um, I, I sensed right away your determination to do something about what happened and your global perspective was evident your focus on this age group, three to six year olds, was clear, crystal clear. I know you've done a lot of conversations around India's daughter. And um, I want to ask you, based on your experience of having these conversations, what do you feel um, is the most important things to unpack? what concepts, what problems around India's daughter. If we could start the conversation there, and then uh, I know it's gonna flow you. Thanks, Sarah. Um, it's all been a really moving beginning to this, um, this communion that we're having. And, and I wanna thank you for that. And um, I'm very uh, moved and, and happy to be with you all here. Um, for me, almost the single most important takeaway from MD's daughter, and there were several over the two and a half years, almost the most important one I would say is the understanding of our accountability mm. in the problem of gender-based violence, in the problem of all 
violence, all lack of compassion in this world and the degree to which we are responsible for mindset. And, and when I say we, I mean us collectively as the creators of sociocultural thinking, societies, groups, communities, countries, wherever there is a culture of thought, a primary belief system that we disseminate, we are to some degree perpetrators of the action that those programmed thoughts lead to. And I think for me, that's one of the most important things and, and most important places we have to start this conversation. We simply cannot, it is not good enough for us to be outraged and express our horror and anger against the men who do this to the women without acknowledging that we've taught these men how to think. There is no point in, in expressing outcry when they step out of line, you know, and distancing ourselves from them or attempting to and saying, oh, nothing to do with me, nothing to do with us, you know, rotten apples in a barrel. It is the entire barrel that is rotten. And we are that barrel. And we have to acknowledge that if we're going to make any difference. And at the end of the day, not the second most important thing, because actually now I'm thinking, well, what I've just said isn't quite as important as what I'm about to say as the takeaway, is that mindset change is the only solution to all of the ills that we face as a world. Mm -hmm. The shootings in the classrooms, the beheadings in the name of a religion, the violence meted out against certain religions, the violence of thought, the lack of compassion, the actual violence, um, the sex selection, the child marriage, the trafficking, I mean, anything you care to name, entrenched racism, um, the murder of, of George Floyd, I mean, on and on and on we can go. It's mindset that's responsible for all of that. The disease we're dealing with, we have to acknowledge is not the violence. That's the symptom of the disease. The disease is the mindset. And until and unless we recognize that um, and do something about it, I think we're simply going around in circles and cycles of violence. Wow. See, I told I told the core circle, Leslie, and you know, the conversation we've been having it, it this, this, this is, we need more of us to, to know what we're saying, like it, it is joining and, and, and um, I, after watching the, the movie, I just want to share, I, I understood the language it was people were speaking in. Watching Hindi, I understand Urdu, I speak Urdu. It, I think added another layer uh, for me because I am, I wasn't, my heritage is from that culture. I'm from Pakistan, same con, uh, geographical and cultural mindsets. Um, I was speaking to my husband right after and I said, and whatever he had to say, I said, can you come and be part of this conversation? And he, he's too shy. He said, no. But I said, we need men to be part of this conversation. Like we, we need everyone to be part of this conversation. Somehow us women have picked up the, the torch and, and, and leading, leading it. Um, and, and that's good. But I want to hear the voices. Uh, uh, of the men and we talked about how we cannot talk these uh, five four rapists <clears throat> murderers they got the sentence yeah that they you know deserved 
However, it was used by the people in power as an opportunity to hide, to not be held accountable. Um, for those of you who have watched the documentary, one of the defense lawyers pointed it out. I didn't agree with a lot of what he said, but that point I did, that there's like whatever 250 members of parliament who are right now not being held to account for the same exact acts that they pay for or they engage in. This was because it got media attention. We need to quieten this down. Let's take care of these young men who did this. So the attention stays on them and away from us. And this is a general worldwide problem issue. Sir, can, um, do you mind if I just interrupt a moment and just no, clarify no. For, for everyone listening in, in case um, uh, they don't uh, uh, understand that the, the point you're making is that um, uh, in the context uh, uh, of the fact that this case for the first time in India um, elicited the death penalty as the quantum of punishment for rape. Um, and, and this was the very first time that the death penalty was, was meted out for rape in India. Um, when I asked the rapists whether this would have any effect in deterring men in the future from raping, because now they'd know that they could actually hang for this. The answer was absolutely confident and assured in saying, it won't deter anyone. In fact, now they'll simply murder the girl after they rape her so that she can't identify us. That's what we are dealing with here. You know, there is an impulse in us to say, hang them. It's the same thing as I said earlier, hang them, it'll get rid of the problem. There's no way it's getting rid of the problem because the problem is partly us and what we've taught these men to think. So just wanted to, to sketch that in and, and forgive me for um, interrupting what you had said and I hope you haven't lost your, your thought um, thread as a result. No. No, no, I haven't. <laughs> That's part of the conversation here is, is um, um, there's so many things. So we need, it, it's good you, you brought that in. Um, I, I'm going to jump to a question I had. Let's talk about what happened after the sentencing, but also after the release of India's daughter. What cultural shifts have you noticed? Um, in India specifically, um, but also through, I mean, I want to talk about Think Equal separately, that journey, but just, just this, ha has there been um, any uh, collection of data after, of some sorts? I know at the end of the movie, there is, you know, reporting of such incidents um, increased. What else have you noticed? I genuinely believe there have been more rape murders. I'm sorry to sound such a dark note, but I keep getting the Google alerts for Delhi gang rape, which have become a part of my life and I cannot switch them off. I don't know why I can't switch them off. It's been eight years since I first switched them on. And I promise you, I have been seeing more and more raped and murdered, raped and hanged, raped and... I don't think anything has changed, really. I mean, more reporting, of course, that's a good thing. But then what? What happens once the rapes are reported? The police to whom the rapes are reported still say, settle take this money and forget about it. You don't want to ruin your life. Do you know how much pressure is put on girls to take money? Many of them do. Let's look at another part of the world because we really do have to shift the focus away from those countries, right. you know? This right. is our country. 
This is the UK, this is the US, this is Canada, this is every country in the world. Let's look at Canada. Canada has a, a self-professed, self-proclaimed, proud feminist prime minister in Justin Trudeau. A lot of uh, good, good things have been brought in by Justin Trudeau, like a equal gender equal cabinet. Let's talk about the reporting of rape in Canada. Any idea what percentage of rapes that are committed in Canada are actually reported? Let me tell you, 6%. 6% of rapes in Canada are reported. And of that percentage, only half are prosecuted. That's now down to 3%. And of that 3%, only half again are convicted. So if you're a man in Canada, you can rape with a 97 point, sorry, 98.5% chance of nothing happening. What are we talking about here? You know, increase in rape reporting is not gonna do anything. Building more shelters for battered women is actually going to normalize things. It's going to say more room at the inn. It's okay. You can beat, you know, more of the women in your life because actually we've just built a new block. I mean, honestly, mm -hmm. if we for one second fool ourselves into believing that being reactive yeah. is going to make any difference, it's not. And unless and until we stand up and be counted and start actually preventing, nothing's going to change for us women and girls. I mean, it's not, when, when was it that Hillary Clinton stood up? Was it 50 years ago now? And said, human rights are women's rights, women's rights are human rights. It seemed such a watershed moment. What has happened since? We're in the same mess as we've been in for centuries. And there are just a very, very few points of light, you know, when you look back over the centuries of, of, of human history, as far as gender is concerned, there are a few tiny pinpricks of light. One of them was in Iceland. Was it in the 60s when women decided, that's it, we are going on strike. We are walking out of our houses and not going to be looking after the children doesn't matter how small they are, we're walking out. The husbands had to come rushing home from work, right? Because <laughs> all the women in Iceland went on strike and they achieved for the first time something significant. Now, was it significant enough? Of course not. <laughs> None of it is significant enough until we start a new generation who think differently. Hmm. But to, to make any headway, you, you have to take some kind of extreme action, you know, that, that shakes it up because just dealing with this as business as usual and making some small changes and a few changes in the law is not gonna get us anywhere. I mean, this case brought about certain tweaks in the law, but culture trumps law. Culture is much stronger than the law. There is a law in India, since we're, you know, the film is set in that part of the world. Um, I'm not dwelling on that part of the world. It's just, it, it, it's part of the, the zeitgeist, you know, and the, and the context of the film. But um, there's a law in India which forbids the giving or taking of dowry for very good reason, because there was a whole spate of what they call dowry deaths, where a husband would, you know, extreme accidents were taking place right near the tandoor in the, in the kitchen. You know, the wife was being, had an accident and was burned to death, many of them, to such a degree that the government said, you know, what well, it's clear what's going on here. Husbands are, getting rid of their wives so that they can get another dowry. And dowry became absolutely forbidden. 
How much percent do you think of Indian families give and take dowry? 90 something? I mean, there is no way that that cultural phenomenon, which is utterly entrenched and embedded in the behavior of people in India is going to be just <laughs> switched off by a law. And it hasn't been, nor will it be. We have to change the mindset. It's the only thing we can do. And I believe if we don't do that, and if we don't act in service of that, there's no hope. Let's take it to that next generation now. Um, and I think our part here, um, we have about five minutes for just this segment. Um, you have a daughter, I have a daughter, I have daughters. And I think you and I both, we have these kind of conversations with our, our daughters in terms of what do we want to see? We're trying to model it. Your daughter was young when you left for India to make the movie. If you can share a little bit about that, what was the impact on her? What has it sparked in her to think equal as well, the age group that you decided to focus on? You can take more than five, like, but yeah. <laughs> it, so it's my daughter Maya was 13 when I left for India. Um, uh, my son Emil was 16 and a half. And when I decided I was going to go to India and make this film, I was very aware that of my two children, the one who needed me the most was my daughter Maya because of her age. Um, in fact, my son didn't even, I'm sure, want me to stay around, you know, but my daughter needed me. And I, I, I brought the whole family together in the living room, uh, my husband, my two kids. And I basically said, listen, guys, here's what I want to do. Um, I feel I need to do this. And here's why. And I, of course, told them I'd been discussing it anyway. And we're very open uh, in my home and the children knew um, a lot about, about the case and, and, and why um, I felt I needed to go. And I'm ashamed to say, in retrospect, this was horrific blackmail, actually. Um, I said to Maya, Maya, you are the one who can stop me because I know you need me. You're 13, you need a mother. You're at that point in life where it's gonna be hard for you to be without me. And if you tell me you don't want me to go, no problem, I will stay. So if that's what you need to tell me, tell me, because for you, I will stay. But I need you to understand that if I do stay, I'll find it very hard to look myself in the face in the mirror again, because I feel so strongly about this that if I don't do something about it, I'm gonna be ashamed of myself. Now that's horrific really, isn't it? Because when I think about that seriously now, that was blackmail. That was not very kind of me. I wasn't really giving my daughter that choice. And of course she said, you have to go, you must go, mommy, you, you go. Um, I of course tried to keep the horror of what I was going through and the darkness of what I was going through away from her. There was one incident when I couldn't do that um, because, and you know, it was utterly involuntary that I couldn't do it, but I, uh, on, on, on one occasion, it was after I had interviewed um, a rapist who, who wasn't the subject of the film, um, but he was a rapist that I had practiced on, sounds a bit perverse to say that I had practiced on rapists, but I had to, because I had to test my own metal because I'd been raped at 18. And I was so frightened that in these interviews with the rapists in prison cells, I might just leap out of my chair and physically assault one of them. Um, that I asked the director general of the prison to allow me to practice on other rapists so that if I did hit one of them, which, you know, to be honest with you, I've never hit anyone in my life at all. Um, but I thought, here's the perfect storm. You know, if ever I'm going to hit someone, this is going to be the time I do it. And I need to check out whether I'm going to have the, you know, forbearance to not do that, <laughs> despite what I considered would be extreme anger. 
Um, none of which, by the way, materialized. I didn't even feel angry when I sat with these rapists because they were programmed, because they were robots. How, how are you gonna be angry with robots? You know, for the same reason as they didn't express remorse or regret because robots don't express remorse or regret. Um, but I sat for three hours with the very first rapist I practiced on and his name was Gaurav, he was 29 and he had raped a five year old girl. And for three hours I sat and heard from him every single detail of what he did to this girl, et cetera. And at the end of this three hours, I asked him to explain to me what went on in his head. And I, and I asked him really quite unjudgmentally. I just said, will you please help me to understand how you go from thinking the thought of what you want to do to actually carrying it out. Just talk me through what goes on in the head. Does the mind say, I shouldn't, I mustn't? What would just, just tell me, talk me through it. And he looked at me like, honestly, he'd never come across such an idiot before. And he looked at me with total disdain. And he said, word for word, he said this, she was a beggar girl. Her life was of no value, word for word. That encounter with him was very, very um, dark and dramatic for me. And I, something like two weeks afterwards, and I attributed to that, to that interview, um, I woke up in this little hostel room, you know, it wasn't quite a hotel, it was a, you know, cheap place I was staying in while I was filming. Um, and I woke up and it was um, 4.30 in the morning, I think. And I was wet from head to toe and I was shaking, I was shivering. My whole body was in a kind of, um, and it was hot. You know, this, this, this was not shivering from cold. Um, what I later understood was that I was having a panic attack. Um, but at the time I was in this complete state of absolute terror. And all I knew was I had to get out of there. I had to get home or I had to get into a hospital, but I was not gonna survive this. Um, and I had the presence of mind to think, I, I can't book my, I can't get myself to a hospital. I don't know how to do it. And I can't book my flight home. I have to call my husband. He has to do something for me. Um, the world's most impractical person, by the way, is who I thought might help me. But anyway, <laughs> anyway, I phone home and it was 12.30 at night. And, and also I managed to work out because of the time difference, what the time would be at home. And it was 12.30 and I thought, okay, the kids will be asleep. And of course my daughter answers the phone because there was zero discipline in my house when, when I was away. <laughs> and, um, and Maya immediately understood there was something wrong with me. She just heard it in my voice. And she said, what's wrong, mommy? And I said, Maya, there's nothing wrong. I'm, I'm, I'm okay. And I really tried to lighten my voice and try to pretend, but to be honest with you, I just couldn't. I was in such a state of panic and, and desperation. I just burst out crying and I said, I'm really sorry, I'm really sorry, but I'm not in a good place and I have to speak to daddy and please can you get me daddy? And she just said, mommy, I want you to breathe. I want you to breathe in through your nose and breathe out through your mouth. Come on, breathe in, breathe out, breathe in. And she did this with me for, I don't know how long, but she did it with me for a while. And then she said, now, mommy, I want you to, Take a pen and paper. Have you got a pen and paper in the room? And I said, yes. She said, go and find a pen and paper. And I just thought, I, I can't, I don't know what, you know. So I pretended I had a pen and paper. And she said, I want you now to start writing down a list of all your problems. And then you're gonna start in the morning to solve them. But I want you to start with the smallest one. Don't start with anything bigger than the smallest one. And this child was just mind blowing. She ended up with, in this conversation saying, and mommy, 
Oh, and I had said to her in the meantime, Maya, I have to come home. I really have to come home. This is too big for me. I can't do this. I made a mistake. This is a big, big mountain. I can't do it. Um, and she said, mommy, you're not coming home because I and my generation of girls are relying on you. And I'll never forget that as long as I live. And then I, that was it. It just took me down off this panic attack. And then when I did come home, she and I brainstormed Think Equal together. And she was the one who said to me, mommy, you cannot make this program. By now she was 15 and a half. And she said, you cannot make this program about gender equality because so many countries just won't want to know. You won't get into Saudi Arabia. You won't get into, you know, and she said, you're just going to have to make it about all equality. And at the end of the day, it is about all equality because, you know, when Gaurav told me that the reason that he raped that little girl and felt absolutely justified in doing so, no remorse, no regret, not for one second in the three hours of interview with him, no remorse or regret for one second in the 31 hours of interviews I had with all the rapists over several weeks. Why? Because he was absolutely sure that her life was of no value. Because that little girl was not only a girl, she was a Dalit, she was a beggar girl, she was of the lowest caste. And casteism in India is one of the most insidious evils. You know, it's apartheid by any other name. The world, you know, found some sense of outrage and eventually was able to put pressure on South Africa with sanctions, etc to stop this evil of apartheid, but it's still getting strong in India and everybody's doing trade with India. What are we talking about here? The hypocrisy of this world, anything that'll turn a buck. Anyway, that's Maya. Goosebumps all over and you know, our next, the next generation, our next generation, like I'm, I'm talking about my kids as well, my girls and, and the girls I mentor, we, there is so much power and transformation going on in their, every cell of their being, they know exactly what needs to be done here. And, and wow, Maya, this light is for you too, for that hope that we so desperately need. Thank you, Leslie, for, I, I, I just got goosebumps with, from that, that conversation. Um, I want to invite um, Brenda in to, let's, let's, I want to move the conversation to taking this from, you know, the potential Think Equal has, and, um, and then let's take it out to that, the, the, broader conversation that needs to happen that Leslie is wanting to happen uh, in terms of moving away from domination cultures and systems to partnership um, to systems change. That's really what we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. Marilyn, before we do that, Marilyn, please go ahead. Oh, uh, unmute yourself um, first, please. I was just, uh, I had this aha moment. And, uh, you know, part of that was, um, you know, Leslie, when you talked about the person that you interviewed and as a looking at that Dalit young girl of five years old and talking about her life of no value, you know, I, I have often said over the last year, year and a half, that the most important book that I've read is Isabel Wilkerson's book on race, caste, and class. And it's, it, you just reminded me of that again, because I don't think that you can have a conversation on any one of those, class, race, or caste. They're all interconnected. Mm -hmm. And it, it all goes down to, to what you said you know, life of no value in the minds of people. Um, and I think that that's a missing component in so many of the conversations that are going on now um, of kind of reflection and, you know, kind of zeroing in and going back on, you know, what, 
what brought us to this point of, of really, you know, thinking that we can classify people. I mean, when I was growing up, the person who was writing about that, and I was small, and, and my, my cousins who were older and in college, they were reading Vance Packard in the United States talking about the 99 classifications of people in the US and how they, they fit and, and what the stratification was. And, and you think about and you go to other cultures and that same thing has really occurred historically. And so, you know, that, that component of history is still a huge missing piece. And if we go to the contributions of, of somebody like um, Eduardo Galeano, who has insisted in his writing, his historical writing, of looking at, for example, all of the Americas. There is not a North, a Central, and a South, but all of the Americas. And that interconnected history and how that interconnected history is built on slavery is built on the fact that people, white people, who came to conquer really felt that they could conquer not only people, but they could culture, they could conquer um, nature, that they had control over both. So that was just my aha moment. And thank you. Thank you for it. Thank you for expressing that so beautifully. And that is so utterly important. I mean, I share it completely, Marilyn. And, and, and when, you know, when I had to decide on a name for this movement initiative and program, for it is all three of them, um, Think Equal for me is still the most important thing we do because it's all about ascribing lesser or no value to the other. And that's exactly what you've just been talking about so eloquently, because at the end of the day, if we come as a conquering, you know, sophisticated race of people who say, well, we know and the savages don't and we will save them and we will help them and we will, you know, um, then then we poison their blankets and we get rid of them. I mean, whatever it is, you know, I mean, you look at the what's happened to indigenous peoples around the world not very long ago with the residential schools and the, I mean, just a matter of a few decades ago, really, this was still going on. And that it's all about that, ascribing lesser or no value to the other. If you truly think equal, the ultimate expression of compassion is equality actually, is to say, look, you are me and I am you, um, you are the other me. Yeah. And uh, we are of absolutely intrinsically equal value. Every single one of us is unique. No two are remotely the same. And you look at institutions and you look at systems, you look at religion. What they fundamentally do is elevate their own. They say, we are the chosen people. We are the ones who have the right beliefs. You don't. You're of less value. And, and that just is not acceptable, you know, but it's how patriarchy and toxic masculinity, which has shaped our world since time immemorial, operates. And, you know, on the sort of more subtle uh, um, spectrum of, of what happens and what is done in the name of human beings to our planet, um, you have a system, a mindset that tells us that the purpose of existence is the accumulation of wealth. You have these vile people who are accumulating masses of, of, of wealth and, you know, spending it on going to the moon um, <laughs> while, while people are starving and being killed and they could care less. It's another face of the same, you know, the same system. Brenda has her hand up. So Leslie, um, I'd kind of like to shift a little bit. Um, 
the what you're talking about is what uh, Rianne Eisler calls domination. Uh, we have a lot of different names, but one of the things she brought forth was the domination. And I'm going to put in the chat um, a link to her site and also to an interview that we did in our V2020 series that was about how did we get here. And so it relates to exactly what you're talking about. And um, Donna was going to also bring up the UN um, SDGs. And the thing I wanted to preface about that is that the United Nations, is, while it has a great intention, um, it's a complex um, authority. And for me, that's about our own authority. And that's what I also heard you say, and I'm wondering if maybe you and Donna could have a little bit of a conversation about, you said, we have taught them this. So how do we change that narrative within our own selves? And because, you know, if it's, if it's a 98.5% uh, possibility that you can get away with anything in one country, it happens in our country, people don't want to talk about it. Yeah. They, so how do we talk about changing this conversation in our own authority as women and any other gender, of course, um, to stand in that self-authority? Because to me, that's the, I must take dominion for my own self. Hmm. Well, I can only tell you how I'm doing it. And it is so easy, it's laughable. I am teaching the right thing or things at the right time to children aged three to six, currently in 20 countries. One of those countries has, is doing, it's North Macedonia, a country which has quite a history of um, conflict, the Balkan War, um, and a lot of discrimination against the Albanian population, against the Roma within its, uh, you know, so it, it, it has issues, it has big issues uh, and big gender-based issues because there is quite a culture of Eastern European machoism, okay? Um, that country is now doing what I dreamed of when I first conceived of Think Equal, and it's only been alive, think equal now for five years since we started our first pilot, okay? North Macedonia has mandated think equal as part of the national curriculum. So every single five-year-old in the whole country has to learn numeracy and literacy and think equal. They are learning three times a week over a 30 week period, their entire academic program, in other words, as much as they're learning mathematics, numeracy, they are learning 25 competencies and skills which are being repeated and scaffolded and they're learning this experientially. And effectively what they're doing, they, they're going through 24 narrative picture books, a book a week and every book deals with several of these competencies and skills, and they include gender equality, racial equality, self-esteem, emotional literacy, emotion regulation, peaceful conflict resolution, compassion as a separate competency and skill, critical thinking, etc. environmental stewardship, 25 without any one of which I believe a human being cannot live a life of dignity that respects also the dignity of others. And these kids are learning this, but they are learning it at a time when the neural pathways in their brains are being created. So what we're doing is actually co-creating the architecture of their brain with pro-social neural pathways. And we are diminishing, we've had three RCTs by now in Colombia, in Australia, and in Botswana, and the same results across these very diverse countries. And literally, 
they are reducing antisocial behaviors and attitudes. And I know that someone on the call, because there always is someone who says, ah, yes, but what about when they go home and they see the father hit the mother and they see, look, I can't legislate for that. There's nothing I can do. By definition, their parents are above the age of six. And I'm sorry to tell you that above six, you've got to go to therapy to undo all that stuff. And it's going to cost you thousands of dollars. But before six, we can do it for $2 per child, change their entire life trajectory to have positive outcomes. And we're doing it. It's happening. So at least they go home and they know what's right and wrong. And they themselves would not be able to pick up their hand and hit anyone even if they see their parents doing it. Vicky has her hand up. Um, well, thank you for <clears throat> mentioning that love and um, helps overcome domination. And uh, part of Rayon's Eisler's um, way of overcoming domination is through partnerism. And I think that that's what you've included when you're partnering up with um, educational systems. And so, um, what I've done is in Spokane, there's a Salish um, language preschool, and then I've helped with um, high school child development courses. And so what I'm trying to do is offer Think Equal to the high schoolers, um, but also try to encourage uh, translation of the books onto the Salish school. And so you're, you have five down downloadable books that are on yes. the Think six, Equal. Six, in fact, that's right, yes. So how, so how can we develop more partnerships so that we can be sharing these resources? Okay, so we put out six weeks worth of the program. Um, we actually have 90 weeks of the program. We have 30 weeks per level. There are three age appropriate levels. It is a full on complex subject that is taught three times a week over 30 weeks of each level. Level one is for the three to four year olds, level two, the four to five, and level three, the five to six. Six books are gonna be lovely and wonderful for the kids to experience, but they're not gonna do it. They're not gonna actually do what needs doing because what needs doing needs to be repeated. It needs to be over a long period of time. It needs to be scaffolded and rehearsed and, you know, it, you can't do this work lightly. If you do it for one whole year, I absolutely believe and know that the life trajectory of that child will be changed. They don't have to do all three levels, but they do have to do one complete level. And six weeks is, you know, one fifth of the whole of the first level. We won't put the, our resources out on the internet in full, because if we do that, We'll find people using them without training. We'll find people using them that we can't be in touch with and say, listen, it's critically important that you don't just skip around this program of 30 weeks. You can't just say, oh, well, I want to teach uh, the seasons in my first couple of weeks. And so I'm going to leap forward to lesson number 24 of week, you know, week 24, because that deals with um, the weather inside me, so that must deal with seasons in some way. Well, it doesn't, it deals with the emotional weather inside me. But anyway, you think, well, I'll use that this week and that this, the whole thing falls apart. It's been put together by 22 global experts in, psych in psychology, neuroscience, education, and human rights. And to respect this work and ensure that it does its job, we need to have all 30 weeks taught. So we do that in hard copy form because I also believe it's very important for our kids to not be like this all the time. We're turning our children into asocial, unsocial beings by allowing this, you know? The children need to see the books and have the books and have the interaction in the classroom. It's a very particularly designed um, program, this. How we can partner is just get it into schools. I mean, it costs such a pathetically small amount of money to act because it's direct costs only. It's the printing of the books. It's the, the training actually doesn't cost because it's digital. So, cause that's for the teachers, right? The teachers train. 
Um, we, we give 10, uh, sorry, um, every week of, of lessons, we give five 10 minute activities to the parents digitally. So it's free. We don't charge for what we don't have to charge for. We're, we're a charity and we only care about scaling this, but we do and must print the books and the materials. Now, the cost of this program is $290 per classroom and it's a one-off cost. And the materials will last a minimum of 10 years. So that's $29 per year for 10 cohorts of children. And if you divide it by the number of children there are, it's what, $2 per child maximum. So it's nothing really. Um, and we should do it right. We should give the entire program, not just six weeks worth of it. Um, we're also making a TV series of it so that we can engage the parents. Again, the TV series is good, but it's not gonna, it's not gonna do that transformation. The transformation is easy, but it has to be done prescriptively in that particular way. I mean, it's the same as saying, okay, we have a vaccine against polio or COVID or whatever it is, and saying, you know what, you don't have to use all the six prescribed ingredients, use two of them, hopefully you'll get the same result, you won't. You know, you need to know the number of doses, uh, exactly what ingredients go in there. If this were an expensive program, I'd be saying, listen, I completely understand. But anyway, we also, we go around and we raise money to pay for teachers and children so that they get it for free. Um, and we have foundations or individuals or the World Bank or UNICEF paying for the programs so that the teachers, because we believe every child has a right to this. I think every child has a right to grow up and not rape, which is another way of looking at things, right? <laughs> it's looking at it through the other end of the telescope. You have a right to grow up and not rape. You have a right to not be taught that you can rape or you know, that a girl who's out at night deserves it, or a girl who drinks is asking for it or whatever it is, uh, so that our children will grow up and not commit suicide. Even if they do get extremely sad, sadness is okay. We teach every one of our children, nothing wrong with sadness, nothing wrong with anger. Everyone feels this. What we need to know is how to control it when it's very unpleasant and very intense. And we have Yale, who are our partners, uh, Yale University's Center for Emotional Intelligence ruler program, which is best practice in the field to do that with. Um, so I hope I've answered the question. Thanks for the link on, on Rianne Eisler, yes. Hi, Thank you, Leslie. It's been really lovely actually hearing um, you. And what I wanted to ask, and you started touching on it, is how you actually came up with the programme. How did you decide on the curriculum? And obviously you've mentioned some of the partners and it's, um, I think you said some psychotherapists or psych, um, psychologists. Psychologists. Yes. Yeah. How did you actually come up with that programme? So look, what I knew when I came off the back of the film was that education was the only way to do this. And how did I know that? Because, well, <laughs> there was quite an interesting way I actually found that out. And, and, and I'll tell you, because it is interesting. Um, I, at a certain point, I look at the rapists I'd interviewed, all of them, and I'm trying to find out what kind of human beings they are. Well, you know, who does this to another human being? Um, and so I'm comparing them, contrasting them, and I'm trying to find the common threads. And I notice that only one of them has finished secondary school. So the spotlight immediately falls on education. And I think, okay, this can't be a coincidence. Lack of education must be a factor. But for those of you who see, who've seen the film, uh, you, you will have been most shocked, not by the rapists, although they're pretty shocking. You'll have been most shocked by the lawyers. <laughs> Because two weeks after I thought, well, lack of education must have something to do with the brutality of the rapists. I find myself interviewing their entire legal teams. They had two teams and the lawyers were much worse than the rapists. And they had enjoyed the highest degree of education as possible for anyone to have. So that led me to understand that it's not the education system that we currently have that is fit for purpose if we're talking about teaching a human being the value of others. 
And you know, the framing question for Think Equal is how can any leader or minister of education worth their salt who takes seriously their, consider their, their duty of care to their youngest and most vulnerable citizens, our children, how can they possibly deem it to be compulsory for those children to learn numeracy and literacy, but optional for them to learn how to value another human being or optional for them to learn how to lead healthy relationships or have self-esteem? It can't be optional. This should actually be the core purpose of early years education, or at least one of the three core purposes around numeracy and literacy. Um, so, so that's how my attention was focused on education. Um, and then I decided, well, of course, the education that we're talking about is the missing education, the missing dimension, which actually isn't there. Um, and because I was no expert, I was a filmmaker. So I thought, well, I'd better gather the experts around me. And I went in search of the first one I went, I went in search of and got um, as my founding patron was Sir Ken Robinson, who was one of the greatest educationalists, I believe, who ever walked the planet. Um, and then, you know, just went further and further afield. Vicky Colbert from Colombia and Barbara Isaacs, the president of Montessori Europe and um, Sheila Wamahiu from Kenya and Urva Shisani from India and, you know, a whole global uh, team of 22 experts. And together, and with the research that I was doing into the neuroscience of brain development, you know, I needed to know at what age is a child capable of changing? Is the brain neuroplastic enough for us to be able to actually change that mindset so that at least that generation grows up having complete and absolute respect for all colors, religions, castes, uh, as you said, uh, Madeline, castes, classes, and genders. I mean, races. Um, so that's how, that's how I got started um, and was absolutely so lucky to have managed to persuade people who generally work in silos on their thing to actually come together and say, yeah, we'll give you our best practice resources. Um, and I had to say, this has to be for nothing. You cannot give it to me and charge because then we can't scale. If we have to charge a premium or a royalty or a something, we will never be able to get this off the ground. We can only do this if we can only have to pay for the printing of the materials pretty much right? So that we can just get it out there at cost. And so it has proven. Um, and in, you know, in some countries we are in, in the Eastern Cape in South Africa, 4,100 classrooms, 168,000 children. Rajasthan in India, where two of the rapists came from, one of the most backward states in India, the Ministry of Women and Child Welfare has asked us to come into every single Anganwadi, which is early year setting, in the whole of Rajasthan. That is the state in India where you find girl babies thrown into dustbins alive. It's the worst. It's horrific, right? Um, they want us in every single Anganwadi teaching this to the 2.5 million children in that state. Now, that's going to cost a fair amount just because of the numbers. But we've got to do it. We've got to find a way of doing it. You know, how many billions are they spending on getting to the moon? Thank you, Leslie. That makes so much sense, actually, just actually understanding how it all came together. Um, I think there's probably, I don't know if there's, there's still questions, I think, from Vicky before we kind of come towards a, a a kind of wrapping up. You have Sarah's hand up. Yeah, I just thought it would be good for Leslie to share while um, what you shared with us about, I, I had asked you what feedback have you gotten from um, the schools in India and, and you shared the story about the mother who actually came um, to speak to the teacher of her daughter what transformation actually had transspired in their home after the daughter? Was this the story? Remember the, 
the skin. The mother, oh, yes, 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 yes. I know that one. Yeah. Well, I mean, there are two stories. I thought you were referring to another one, which is just also so powerful that I... Um, let me start with the, the story of, of this mother who um, she ran into class, um, having brought her daughter to class in the morning, as she always does, and said to the teacher, please, please, please tell me, what have you just been teaching the children like yesterday, very, very recently? And the, the teacher told me she got a bit worried because she thought maybe the mother was going to say, I don't want you to teach her equality or whatever it was, you know. Um, and the teacher cautiously said, well, d d tell me what's happened and, and then I'll tell you. <laughs> you know? um, and the mother said, well, in, in our family, we have a maid who I absolutely cannot sack or I would if I could, but she's been in this family for generations. She was my mother's, the, my mother's mother before her. She's very, very dark. And, you know, my daughter was born not liking dark people. She's just born that way, you know. The teacher knew that was true because this little girl, very pale skin, um, uh, though, though brown skinned, but pale, pale girl who wore ribbons and was, you know, very um, pampered little, little child, only played with one other girl in the class who was fair skinned and refused when they had to sit in circles or hold hands, she wouldn't hold the hand of anybody who was darker than she was. Um, and the mother said, look, I've had a real problem here because in the morning I dress my daughter to go to school and that's, that's okay. Uh, and I feed her breakfast, but then I go to work once I've dropped her at school. And the maid, as you know, picks her up. And when I get home from work at six, this child has not eaten all day. She will not allow the maid even to feed her because she won't let her dark hand near her. This morning, I find my daughter in the bathroom caressing the maid's arm and saying to her, whatever her name was, look, your skin is dark brown like chocolate and that's delicious. And see, my skin is light brown like cinnamon, and that's delicious. And did you know that we are one brown family? This is exactly what Think Equal teaches. In week one, level one, we have this beautiful resource that teaches the children, there is no such thing as black and white, because if I was white, well, what color then? If you can see my arm and this, what color is this plug then if I'm white, right? We're different colors. And if the little girl they call black were black, well, what color is her hair then? We're all brown, every single one of us. And when you take a very light brown patch, we give the teachers in their four and a half kilogram pack of their lesson plans, their books, their resources. We also give them one brown crayon. And in week one, the kids go in pairs and they do a very pale, very pale brown circle and a very dark one. And when they match them up, they see that the girl they call black is actually dark brown. And I or the girl they call white is actually light brown, which is the truth of science, melatonin in our skins, you know. <laughs> anyway, bottom line is, you know, that that was one of the I mean hundreds of stories, probably now in, in their early thousands of stories we've had. But just the last little story in Canada, a little boy, three and a half years old, arrives, the te not teacher, it was the head of the school, Gail McDonald from Plum Tree Daycare, wrote to me in a January, the kid had gone in September to Plum Tree for the first time. And she said, she's never seen such a violent little child. He was she said, just a bag of social emotional problems. He would kick his mother's shins as she tried to leave him. She would cry out. That's how hard he was kicking her shins. Um, he either sat under a cloud of anger or sadness. He had no other emotions. He would hit and bite and scratch. And one month in, Gail told me, um, this child bit a girl and drew blood. And the parents got to hear of it. The next day, the parents came, called an emergency meeting and said to the head, you either expel this child immediately or we are taking every single one of our children out of your school. They had all conferred and decided that. And Gail said she was not a public speaker, but she said, I could not bear the thought that I would be a party to this child at the age of three and a half, 
having his whole future predicted by being expelled and having this black mark against his name for the rest of his life, you know? And she said, I just knew that if I did that, if I collaborated in this, he would end up killing someone, raping someone, hurting himself. I don't know, but she knew something bad would happen. And she said to them, listen, I beg you, give me one chance. I have got, I've just started a program one month ago and it's called Think Equal. And we're about to start teaching anger management and tools to curb high and intense emotions. Give me a chance. They allowed her a chance, they said, as long as she watched him like a hawk. And, and she did, she took that very seriously. She was writing to me three months after that incident. And she said, after another month, he was not using his hands and feet anymore. He was, but he was still an angry child, still using his, his language, you know? And then she said, four months in, I've just seen something in his classroom which prompted me to write to you. If I hadn't seen it with my own eyes, I would never have believed it in a million years. Only four months had passed. She was in his classroom, saw him playing with three other boys. They were playing some memory matching game. One of the boys was getting frustrated because he wasn't getting the luck and making the matches. And she saw, and she called him my terrorist from last September. She said, I saw him put his arm around this boy. He looked him in the eyes. He said, don't be sad, you can do this. And then he gave him a hug. Brain building is what it's called, simple. Well, I'm left without. Please, uh, Brenda, Betsy, do you want I, to I I'm just um, really touched deeply by this work and your testimonies. Thank you so much. And what I also know happens from this, it's, it's like when we build from the ground up and, and we start, we're planting new seeds. These children are planting new seeds in their households as well. Yes. Yes, yes, hundred yes, percent, and we have so many stories of that. Honestly, yeah. So it changes the makeup of our societies from the youth to the elders in such a way. Can imagine that woman who, you know, was finally touched by that child. And um, I was involved in a program in the Bay Area that has had similar results um, from tool toolbox and it's fabulous self-soothing tools and these children would go to their doctor and the doctor then would say where where's your child go to school and mm -hmm. so they started supporting this program and is so, it called toolbox did you say yes, it? What? yes it is toolbox. i'll look yeah. it up lovely i'll have you look it up and um yeah. and and they're doing marvelous work and so and it was um how did the Dalai Lama really supported it as well? Uh, and um, I just, I would love that collaboration of your work and theirs and just thank you. Thank we'd you. love to be introduced to them. Fantastic. Yeah. Yes, yeah. indeed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> so Leslie, um, how do we go about um, creating partnerships with with schools or with um, community members that would help promote this not and make it more of a long term thing instead of just an introduction? <clears throat> well, I, I, I love that question because you see you're going straight to it. Let's do it. Let's get let's get active here because that is ultimately all that counts. And um, basically. I think the easiest way is to go to groups of schools, networks of schools. Um, I don't know in the US, I know you have Head Start. And by the way, we are in talks with region nine of Head Start and they're talking about three um, in the Southwest, region nine is the Southwest. And they're talking about three states where they're starting in a few settings. In Illinois, we've got uh, uh, not three, two, I think, Cahokia and District 186, two districts that are doing this. Um, St. Louis Public School, which has 150, is the biggest public school in uh, Missouri, 
wants to do it. I just have to find some funding for them. Um, we, we should go to networks because going to one class and another class, it, it just takes too long. Um, so going to superintendents actually is the best. If any of us know superintendents, which is why actually, Marilyn, I've been speaking for so long now to Anne about San Antonio and the mayor of San Antonio, because you know this is where we can be really influential and get whole cities or whole towns or you know whatever it is actually rolling this out. The mayor of Manchester, Andy Burnham in England, um, is now committed to rolling this out in all 11 regions of Greater Manchester, which is, it's a huge area from this September. It, that's how it works. We go to that head of, or the leader of that council or the mayor of that town or the superintendent of that school district and say, look, here is something incredibly effective. It's evidence-based. Um, it's ridiculously inexpensive. Schools can even use the America Cares Act money that they have, um, the ARP, American Rescue Plan, and funds called ESSER funds. I think they're E-S-S-E-R or E-S-S-A. I'll, I'll find that out. But there are three buckets of funding they can even use for this $290 one-off cost, you know. Not that they need to, because it's nothing at the end of the day. Well, it's not much. Um, but I think that's what we can do, is to try and persuade groups of schools to take it on um, and, then, and then spread it. I mean, in LA, we have a very, very famous flagship school. Amanda Gorman, is that her name? The mm. poet laureate. She went to this school. It's called New Roads. And they are rolling up Think Equal, and they brought another three schools in, but then it hasn't gone beyond that. Now that's four schools, I'm thrilled to bits, four schools are doing it, but we need thousands of schools to be doing it because it's only when we scale that we're gonna make that seismic systemic difference in the next generation. Did that answer the question, Vicky? So um, in 2015, I, I understand that the um, sustainable development goals are complex. However, um, the Charter for Compassion and um, the women and girls sector do um, have a few of those that we support or try to follow. Um, and so we are curious how you think equal, and I and I also have some observations too. Um, you said you founded Think Equal in 2017, correct? No, earlier than that. 2017 was the first um, pilot we ever did. 2015, my film was released and I spent much of that year doing my duty by the film, but then started brainstorming Think Equal and gathering the experts and starting to create the materials. So yeah. I, uh, my circle knows me and my synchronicities. So Think Equal came out at the same time that member nations of the United Nations accepted these sustainable development goals. Interesting. And the goal is to have change, at least a lot of it by 2030. 2030, I know big goals. So given you brought up mass shootings or, or active shootings, domestic violence, and most of your mass shooters are of males and of 18 to 21. Um, yep. They just broke up a huge militant white supremacist group of, I don't know, 40, 50 guys of this same age group in their mid-20s. My daughter is a deputy who works in a jail and she said she is nauseated and has also spoken to rapists and pedophiles that she has to oversee. And she said, it's very difficult to have to be humane to these people that she knows that in a heartbeat would harm her 
own daughters. Sure. Um, so rapists are rapists the world over in their mindset of dominance and oppression. So our goals, our UN goals in women and girls are gender equity, of course, to, um, especially for women and girls, to empower all women and girls. We have sustainable cities and communities, um, which is making the um, settlements, human settlements safe, resilient, inclusive, and sustainable. We also have our peace and justice and strong institutions um, promoting peaceful, inclusive, sustainable, and accountability um, in societies and in justice and institutions, and also the partnership of the goals to strengthen the means of implementation um, and revitalize the global partnership. And also too, I also see too that um, the four pillars that had been brought up earlier too, talks about um, children. And um, I was always told that five, the age of five, you teach all the children everything they need to know by the age of five. And if you, and you train them in the way they'll go by then, regardless of how old they get, they will come back to that. Um, a, but they'll come back to that. So totally, I agree with um, the age group, but I also find it interesting too, here we're battling with these health issues, mental health issues with this same age group that in the thirties, in come 2030, your young people will be that same age group. Correct, and they will not be shooting up classrooms. Exactly. And they will not be raping. Aside from teaching them there are other things that we have to do but how do your think equal how does that work within our women and girls and the charter un sustainable goals well we address directly 10 of the 17 goals life on land life underwater peace and justice um gender equality go for education i actually sit on a um a mission 4.7 um, um, high level think tank with Ban Ki Moon chairing and Jeffrey Sachs co chairing, and Audrey Azule, the D Director General of UNESCO, uh, Pope Francis, um, and, and uh, Fernando Rimas, who runs, uh, is the leader of the Harvard Graduate Education School, etc. Um, and, and, you know, my problem, I have, I have to be really honest here, right? My problem with theories is that they stay as theories. And for me, there is nothing that matters anymore or is of any value whatsoever, including that mission 4.7 that I'm on. It's a very illustrious group of people. They talk a wonderful storm every time we meet. And then what? what, unless it's translated into actual active programmatic tools, it doesn't mean anything. It's like the OECD has now made its report about, you know, how critically important 21st century skills are to the labor market of the future. They talk in those terms because the labor market means more to them than anything else in life, okay? That's what they're constituted for. Um, and every government respects the OECD and they are the doyen of all things, you know, all wisdom. So every country in the world actually doubt now does have an early years framework, uh, which encompasses these very wise academic notions of, you know, we have to teach critical thinking and we have to, but it's meaningless because it is an academic theoretical piece of paper that is being given to practitioners and teachers who you've treated as babysitters, you've underpaid, you've undervalued, you've not even bothered to train them. And now you're giving this high flown academic document and saying, give me a gender sensitive. You're not even saying that actually, gender doesn't come into it, it's not that important. You know, they don't list gender, they list collaboration and creativity and the five C's very neatly, you know, the, the, the re requisite skills and competencies for the 21st century labor force says the World Economic 
forum by complete coincidence begin with the letter C. Isn't that marvelous? Nothing else needed. You know, it's utterly ridiculous. And it's talk, talk, talk. So for me, I'm 65 now. I don't have any patience left and I don't have much time left. As far as I'm concerned, we've got to do, do, do. And that's all that matters. Sorry, a little, little outburst of frustration there, but that's because, you know, <laughs> I think to the two and a half years when I started out, I was advising the Human Rights Office of the UN. I mean, I don't want to waste your time, but it got to the point where I was told by Prince Zaid, who was the head of the, uh, he was the High Commissioner for Human Rights. And he liked what I was doing. And he said, I just need you to go to my Geneva office and persuade the curriculum department there that we, you know, we got a partner on this. Because I said, Prince Zaid, look, it's two and a half years. I need a stamp from the UN. I need a something here. Because otherwise, what am I doing? What is this advising the UN? It's all very nice. It's a comfortable thing to tell people. But you know, it, what are we doing? Um, so I had to go to Geneva and persuade this woman um, Hippolyta, what was her name? I wish I remembered it because actually she, uh, unfortunately, I think, you know, it's, it's sometimes good to name names. But anyway, I can't remember her name. She's lucky. Oh, no, I can. It's Irena Hippolyta. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I can, I can, I can. And she absolutely point blank refused because she said, we can't give our stamp to someone who we haven't collaborated in this. And I said, well, it's okay. You know, we're still working on it. We can still collaborate. Um, and she said, no, we are doing our own thing. And I thought, oh my God, what about girl 17, you know? So that, that was it. I walked out on the UN Human Rights Office. I said, what, I'm gonna waste my time here advising you when we can't work together? What's the point? So. I don't know, I just have a, I, I, I've developed a very thick, you know, impatient short fuse is what I've developed. Well, Leslie, you're proving to be Leslie. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm reminded. Um, you know me I, too I, well, Marilyn, that's I, like, I had a chance uh, at the end of Margaret Mead's life to see her and she was receiving an honorary degree at one of the colleges I was working at. And uh, you know, she accepted it and she said, okay, bring me a chair and bring me a table and a glass of water. And she didn't give her speech and she just sat down behind the table and she said, you know, I'm of an age where I don't care too much about these degrees. You've asked me here to talk about the role of uh, graduate students in anthropology. And she looked at the, the audience and those who got their degree. And she said, there's not much for you to be doing out there. She said, uh, you know, I'm a seasoned person. She said, I'm an old person. And here's what I wanna do. I wanna work with young people because they have the creativity and the energy. And um, I wanna work with old people because we have the spunk and we've gone through the seasons. And all of you people in between, step back, let us do it. And so I, I envision Think Equal, as you said, um, these young people will be there and they will multiply and will continue to move towards a, a tipping point. And I think that, uh, you know, I'm also reminded that we can't forget, uh, we don't have the luxury of forgetting about the people in the middle, like Margaret Mead said we, we might do. Uh, and that's why the charter, you know, has adopted Think Equal for zero to three, and we're looking at, you know, C learning and involved with them for K through 12 and certainly CIT or whatever it is now in its uh, new stage of transformation for people over um, high school age. So we'll continue to, you know, to look to this and we'll continue hopefully to support Leslie. And you just reminded me that I don't know if we've ever gone to the American Superintendents of Instruction. No, it oh, hasn't. No. And, and that, that's all the superintendents in the United States. And I don't know if there's counterparts in, in the UK or other places, but we better wake up tomorrow and uh, 
try and wow. make contact. And uh, is that a hand raise, Betsy? Yes. And as a and as a mom whose children went through Head Start, there is a Head Start department that you can also go to. Yeah. Wow. And, um, they are very they're very receptive in lots of things in teaching and new ideas and keeping children um, active and creative. So yeah, there's Vicky, a whole Vicky, that's the answer. That's it, Vicky. Yeah. And, and Sire is going to find the place, uh, the right associations in Canada. And so we'll be on the march. Amazing. Thank you so much, Leslie. Thank, thank you. you all. What a wonderful atmosphere. Thank you so much. And thank you for your questions and for, for just much of what's been said. It's, it's been inspiring and warming and, and now I'll carry on working. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please do not stop. <laughs> <laughs> Another four hours or so before I get a chance to sleep tonight. But um, it's been lovely being with you, really, really lovely. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Take care. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody.